Um, sure. So um, I'm a PhD candidate in human computer interaction at uh, UCL. I'm uh, taking a Vygotsky in perspective on uh, data interpretation. So I'm uh, very interested in symbols, but um, I'm talking about language today, but uh, don't ask me about verbs or anything like that. I'm kind of um, th th thinking about things more broadly in terms of um, roles, functions of language. Um, and yeah, th thank you very much for um, all of you for making it here. I think um, when we get to the discussion session, we'll have um, lots of possible avenues here because it's such a big topic. Um, and I sort of go from one area of it to the next. Uh, I, I think um, I've got a lot to learn from lots of you here today. Um, so I was talking to uh, my friend about this yesterday and I was saying, I, I'm basically going to do a talk to explain why um, humans have language and animals don't. And she said, well, how do you know that animals don't have language? And I was kind of saying, well, I mean, they kind of do, but I mean, they don't have the same sort of thing. And she was saying, well, how do you know, like th there's these pigeons here. How do you know that they're not um, talking um, amongst themselves and we just can't understand them? Isn't it kind of a bit, um, egocentric to just assume that it's just us humans who are um, having these conversations. It was a bit of a strange thing to know how to um, answer, but uh, just to start with that, uh, yeah, how, how, how do we know that uh, dolphins aren't secretly plotting to uh, take over the earth? And I, I think, so there are um, a few kind of really boring answers like, um, that most animals don't have the um, vocal apparatus and the muscles uh, for the dexterity to be able to um, utter a word so that it's um, uh, one expression rather than another that yeah that they, they don't have that kind of dexterity there's also been um, well, we can use information science to uh, study animal calls and see how much of it is uh, noise um, if language is based on syntax, then that means that it's based on parts that are being put together in different ways. So we should be able to hear uh, those parts in the signal um, in in their calls. And it seems like that's not the case. Um, we have these kind of phenomena of like different birds have slang. So you've got birds in one area that um, express things differently. Uh, if you uh, listen to them, it sounds like they're talking differently to birds in another area, but that's just kind of still us interpreting it because what's different compared to um, putting two humans together is you can put any of those birds from different places, um, take a bird from one place, bird from another place, put them together, and they will instantly respond to each other um, as if talking to someone speaking their own slang. There doesn't seem to be any additional learning involved. But I think the most interesting difference. It's to do with thinking, well, what do we mean by saying animals communicate or talk or that animals have meaning? And I think that's something to do with what they're doing. What is it that they're doing by talking? And that's kind of mainly what I'm focusing on today. And to start with a spoiler alert in terms of where I'm going is what Nabal Dilienkov says about it. The human being and only the human being immediately ceases to merge with the form of her life activity, separating it from itself and placing it before herself, that is transforming it into representation. So hopefully by the end of um, me uh, talking about this, you'll understand what this quote means. Although I'm not gonna um, come at it directly, there's gonna be a few different things in play. The most interesting research uh, sort of contemporary research that's um, happening on this, um, according to many people, it's not just my opinion, um, is being conducted by Michael Tomasello and colleagues. He just has made so many um, discoveries and innovations in both um, methods and findings, mainly through comparing 
um, our um, primate neighbors, uh, great apes, chimps, um, and humans in terms of what they can do. And there are some interesting things about uh, what apes can learn. Um, most famous research by Sue Savage Rumbuff with Kanzi, the chimpanzee. Um, Kanzi was able to um, learn some aspects of sign language and uh, Kanzi learns in a very limited way to point. So chimps in the wild, they don't point for each other. Uh, but chimps in captivity, they can learn to point, but they learn to point in a very specific way. When uh, they point, they point to say, I want that. They point to the thing that they want. And in both Vygotsky's and Tomasello's phrasing, they're basically using the adult as a conduit to the thing that they want. So I want the bananas, so I'm going to point to the bananas, that the human's going to go get the bananas for me. Um, human babies point for all kinds of reasons. They point to show that um, something's interesting. They point to let someone know that something is there. And um, if you point at a stick, for example, and you're a human, then there are all kinds of complexities there. Because just with my gest gesture of pointing, I might be saying, watch out, there's a stick there. I might be with my point saying, look at that beautiful stick. I might be saying, um, let's use that stick um, to um, hit uh, those um, beehives or whatever it is. Just in that gesture, there are all kinds of things that seem to be packaged um, for humans into the pointing. And apes just don't seem to be able to um, learn that. Most animals, if you point, they look at your finger. Great apes, they understand the um, I want, um, and they don't really go beyond that. So why is that? Um, right at the start of people studying this, it was thought that it was just about, well, with, with the right training, apes will be able to do it. We've had lots and lots of training. It does not seem like it is to do with training. So then the alternative was, okay, well, there must be something in our genes. And most famously, Chomsky kind of overturned um, behaviorism really as, a, as an approach in um, psychology, but specifically around language acquisition. And Chomsky suggested, look, in this short time, all these complexities of human language, it must be that we, we are born with a universal grammar. We've got this sort of software um, that all humans are born with that lets us acquire um, language very quickly. However, um, we've been searching for this universal grammar. Well, what is it that all languages have in common? Chomsky thought it was um, what's called as um, recursion, but recent findings suggest he's wrong about that. Daniel Everett um, with the uh, Peter Hart people, they don't have uh, recursion, suggested that's not the case. We've not been able to find any universals. And there are other reasons to suggest that maybe we don't have a universal grammar. And the view which I'm exploring, although I won't go too deeply into it, is an interesting one. And it's that the grammar isn't inside ourselves. It sounds kind of obvious, but the grammar is in the language itself. It's in the language that we find the complexity. What um, Michael Tomasello's approach is doing is it's focusing on the role of the social in development, not focusing on genes or conditioning, but thinking about sociality as a force in nature. He calls his approach neo-Vygotskyan um, because um, it's all about how we learn because we are social beings. Um, I might learn the word cat because the word cat lets me show you that I'm interested about the cat. There's a cat. Um, I, I Because I want to do something together with you or I want to share something with you, um, I can involve um, a word as a mediating artifact uh, to express that. Um, this is a Vygotskyan story that will be uh, familiar to lots of you, but 
uh, prior to Tomasello, um, it, you'd be surprised at the extent to which it was um, ignored. Um, basically, what we're saying is that we are apprenticed into um, language to a very large extent. Uh, Tomasello's um, convincing account in response to uh, Chomsky is to say, no, actually, we can learn uh, simple grammatical structures and uh, bootstrap and build more complicated ones on top of them. And both for us as individuals and for human culture as a whole, there is a ratcheting effect. So there's this exponential growth that can happen. Um, and this is about sociogenesis. This is about thinking about development in terms of um, the social. Um, and here's Vygotsky's famous uh, general genetic law of development. Every function in the cultural development of the child appears on the stage twice in two planes. First, the social, then the psychological. First, between people as an inter-mental category, then within the child as an intra-mental category. Um, that process of internalization is at the heart of uh, Vygotsky's work. And here is Ilyenkov, and there's differences, and we'll come back to it, I think. Um, one thing I want to argue is that the differences aren't as big as some want to suggest. Uh, Ilyenkov says, consciousness only arises where the individual is compelled to look at himself as if from the side, as if with the eyes of another person, the eyes of all other people, only where he is compelled uh, to correlate his individual action with action of another man, that is to say, only within the framework of collectively performed life activity. Strictly speaking, it is only here that there's any need for will in the sense of the ability to forcibly subordinate one's own inclinations and urges to a certain law, a certain demand dictated not by, the, by individual organics, not by genes for one's own body, but by the organization of the collective body, the collective that has formed around a certain common task. And what, um, Tomasello has done is uh, shown using experimental psychology uh, the many ways in which um, this does actually play itself out and uh, the way in which this helps us with lots of um, things that have been, have been exp um, explanatory gaps uh, for a long time in traditional Western psychology. But um, I think there are some problems with Tomasello's account. I um, greatly admire what um, Tomasello is doing, and I, um, I think more people should look at the findings that he's discovered. But philosophically, he's not as good. He has a kind, kind of a piecemeal approach to philosophers, and he likes philosophy a lot. But um, he will quote one philosopher and then quote another philosopher who help who happens to hold a contradictory view without really following through um, what it would mean to. Um, have both of these separate philosophers in the same theory. Tomasello's theory about how sociogenesis happened, his story is something like this. In prehistory, we had individual intentions, but no language to explain them. Then our individual intentions became shared intentions when we recognized that others share our goals and applied our own mental states to them. When people acquired shared intentional states, it allowed them to coordinate a shared ground of knowledge about the world and to develop and learn social conventions. So um, he talks in his recent book, Becoming Human, um, about this in terms of the philosopher the, of liberalism, John Rawls. He says that it's because we are born kind of hardwired Rawlsian liberals with um, a sense of mutual respect for others and trust uh, which then allows language to develop so that we can um, co collaborate and become and see ourselves as um, members of society. Um, the big difference is between in this um, general genetic law of development, what comes first? Is it the social becomes first or is it the child, uh, the child as an individual in their own mind? Um, the contents of their minds that comes first, or is it the contents of the social world that comes first? And I think that Vygotsky is right here and Tomasello is wrong. And one reason for that is I'm not sure what a shared intentional state is. 
I'm not sure what an intentional state is full stop, how we tell apart one intentional state when one ends, when another begins. Um, do we need another intentional state to know when we're sharing the intentional state? I would prefer to go with Racine and Carpendale's interpretation of this research and say that an intention exists following both Vygotsky, Vygotsky and Wittgenstein embedded in its situation. In their interactions with others, children do not observe a pattern of activity and then go about computing the underlying meaning. Children instead come to see psychological concepts directly in such patterns of action. What I share in a game of chess is not the intentional states of my opponent, it's the chess piece directly in front of us as it is involved in, my, in our activity. So that has made me think, what do I need to do to retrace this journey in order to not make these kind of pitfalls I think Tomasello is making here. So I've taken a totally different path to get us to here, to this sociogenesis. And that's to go back and think about Vygotsky's own sources and the sources of the Vygotsky school. And there's one particular thinker who's very interesting here, and most of you probably haven't heard of him, and that's James Mark Baldwin. I'm going to quote uh, Leontiev's student and um, collaborator and the friend and collabor collaborator of Ilyenkov, um, Alexei Leontiev. Leontiev says, mastering stimulation, man masters his own behavior. In submitting himself to its natural laws, he in this way subjects it, it to himself, in this sense, turning it into voluntary behavior. We see that at the foundation of this process lies the general process of the socialization of man, the beginning of collective labor and economic activities, which signify that humanity has entered the historic phase of its development. This is the chief condition for the appearance of higher forms of behavior, including language. Here we have an extremely complicated process of the double re relation of interchange between the individual and the social com and his social comrades. In this process, in J.M. Baldwin's terminology, the social element projecting itself into the personality forms the subjective, which by a return movement is transmitted anew to other people and thus becomes ejective, becomes the social form. Now, that's a mouthful, but I think it's an interesting mouthful because what happened is that uh, James Mark Baldwin for a number of years was the second most famous psychologist in America. And then his reputation was uh, destroyed overnight so that uh, you could not mention him uh, because he was found in the house of a black prostitute. So um, all of his books were um, destroyed. Um, and the only people who continue to talk about um, Baldwin were uh, Vygotsky and Leontiev for a long time and Piaget. Even though um, Baldwin is a very interesting figure and he was recently rediscovered um, in the 90s um, by two figures. One I'm not going to talk about and that's Daniel Dennett. Uh, the other is uh, Terence Deacon um, in his book Symbolic Species. I'm going to explain what Baldwinian evolution is now. Baldwinian evolution is so interesting because the point of it is that it looks like Lamarckian evolution, where Lamarck thought that the things animals learned, they could pass down to their young. And there was a huge fight between uh, Darwinian and Lamarckian evolutionists and made more, problem made more problematic by the fact that Darwin was a Lamarckian um, and what happens is in the Soviet Union, um, Team Lamarck had Lysenko and all kinds of terrible things happened in research. If only they had listened to um, Vygotsky and Leontiev, because this is Darwinian evolution that explains Lamarckian effects. Deacon explains, Baldwin suggested that um, learning and behavioral flexibility um, 
can play a role in, oops, sorry. Sorry. Um, Baldwin suggested that learning and flexibility can play a role in amplifying and biasing natural selection because these abilities enable individuals to modify the context of natural selection that affects their future kin. Behavioral flexibility enables organisms to move into niches that differ from those their ancestors occupied, with the consequence that succeeding generations will face a new set of selection pressures. So, for example, um, herding cultures have lower lactose intolerance. So Europeans um, were um, herding cultures. Um, Europe, far, far lower lactose intolerance uh, than in China. Um, but nonetheless, um, there are still people who are lactose intolerant. I'm lactose intolerant because the other thing that happens then is it, ha it happens in stages. And um, some people worked out that if you turn milk into uh, cheese or yogurt, you can still keep eating it without the bad effects. And some cultures learned cheese making and the cultures that learned to be good at cheese making could teach others cheese making and they were more likely to survive and they could survive in places that others couldn't because cheese allows you to live, for example, so some of the earliest places where it was made along the Swiss Alps, it, you could live there uh, to compensate for the lack of sunlight because cheese is a store of vitamin D. Uh, they don't know it's a store of vitamin D, but um, it's natural selection working in tandem between what they're rationally doing and passing on in their culture and um, the consequences um, of that, that are themselves being passed down. So it's, um, as you can see, uh, Deacon's book is called The Co-Evolution of Language in the Brain. The radical thesis is that it's language that made uh, the brain evolve, not that there's an inner grammar, that language was evolving the brain at the same time as the brain was evolving language. It's a back and forth, stage by stage process. Um, and we, we can come back to that because this bit is quite complicated, but what happens over time is um, a niche means. So you can make it work. You can be the people um, who's who are in that village where they make lots of cheese. And then here are the things that they do, uh, some of the other things that they do, and, and it, it works for them. And so they pass it on to uh, future, future generations. And so uh, that, beco that becomes their niche um, and eventually it is centralized in the genes. So that does not mean that Francis Crick is right and we're eventually going to find the gene for language, the gene for cheese making. It means that there are these networked eff effects that mean that what you're actually selecting for is being the kind of person that's going to be able to learn uh, these. And it's funny to say, but so cheese uh, has a selection, you know, it, Cheese is a force of evolution. Cheese has a selection pressure on uh, humans, but it's not cheese itself. And it's not the knowledge of cheese. It's this strange unity of knowing how to make cheese and actually making it um, that's key here. So what that tiny um, selection advantage that cheese gives, the kind of master um, advantage is given by language, because of course with language, you can uh, um, teach far more people to make cheese and everything else. But yeah, we'll come back to that, to that. Vygotsky was excited by this. He made it into, made a part of his general genetic law um, with some help from Marx and um, some of the other psychologists working ar around Baldwin. He is um, citing Ripo. The imagination forever remains true to its nature, whether it's manifest, um, whether it's manifestations itself individually or collectively, no one knows how many acts of imagination it took to transform the plow, which started out as a simple piece of wood with a fire shaft end from this simple manual tool into what it became after a long series of alterations that are described in the works devoted to this subject. In the same way, the dim flame from a branch of Cenus wood, which was the first crude primitive torch led us for a long series of inventions to gas and electric, uh, electric lighting. All the objects used in everyday life, including the simplest and most ordinary ones, are, so to speak, crystallized imagination. 
Now, it hasn't really been written about. I, I will write about it. This word crystallization is very technical and um, important to Vygotsky, and he keeps uses it. He keeps using it again and again. Um, here's another quote of just Vygotsky. We began our research with a psychological analysis of several forms of behavior that are found not frequently, it's true, in everyday common life and are thus known to everyone, but are also to a high degree complex historical formations of the earliest epochs in the mental development of man. These techniques or methods of behavior arising stereotypically in given situations represent virtual, solidified, petrified, crystallized psychological forms that arose in remote times in the most primitive stages of cultural development of man and in remarkable way were, preser were preser preserved in the form of historical survivors in the petrified and in the living state in the, in the behavior of modern man. Now what Vygotsky, I want to say, was grasping towards is what would for Ilyenkov uh, become part of his theory of the ideal. So here's a quote from Ilyenkov. It is this that confronts the individual as the thoughts of preceding generations realized, reified, objectified, alienated, and sensuously perceptible matter in language and visibly perceptible images, in books and statues, in wood and bronze, in the form of places of worship and instruments of labor, in the designs of machines and state buildings, in the patterns of scientific and moral systems and so on. All these objects are in their existence, in their present being, substantial material, but their essence, in their origin, they are ideal because they embody the collective thinking of people, the universal spirit of man. It's a very complicated um, concept that we're dealing with here. I'm going to try to give um, a slightly more broken down example for those of us who are not familiar with Ilyenkov, um, where he's talking about the psychologist Rubinstein. Ideality mainly characterizes, mainly characterizes the idea or image insofar as they, becoming objectified in words, entering into the system of socially evolved knowledge, which for the individual is something that is given for him, in objective reality thus acquire a relative independence, separating themselves, as it were, from the mental activity of the individual. It is these forms of the organization of social, collectively realized human life activity that exist before, outside, and completely independently of the individual mentality. In one way or another, materially established in language, in ritually legitimized customs and rights. Okay, um, I appreciate this is very abstract. So I wanted to come, uh, to come from uh, the abstract to the concrete in terms of what we are talking about here. Um, study following Baldwinian evolution or niche construction. Uh, really interesting study by uh, Lansing and Fox. And Lansing and Fox directly ask, can niche construction be Marx's humanized nature? Um, which is closely related to what we were talking about here in the Lienko's ideal. They say, presently, there is little role for conscious planning in the theory of niche construction which explains the intricate architecture of environments like termite mounds as products of Darwinian selection. But in cases like the rice terraces, um, the role of conscious intention cannot be ignored. As Marx observed, a spider, um, uh, a spider conducts operations that resemble those of a weaver and a bee puts to shame many an architect in the construction of her cells but what distinguishes the worst of architects from the best of bees is that the architect raises his structure in imagination before he erects it in reality and they use archaeological and computational mathematical modeling to look at um, the rice terraces um, ancient rice terraces in Bali and to test one of two hypotheses either was it the plans of architects and Bali rulers that led to these um, successful uh, niches being constructed uh, meant that they could survive for generations 
um, within this niche of the uh, rice terrace, or did it kind of happen uh, bottom up, just farmers, trial and error, etc. The strange thing here is we end up with marks aligned with the top down rationalistic architects, the barley ruler, and the farming co ops are the anti Marxist side. Now, clearly, something has uh, gone wrong in the thinking here. And actually, uh, Lansing and Fox are very sophisticated thinkers. I was really happy to see they concluded the paper by saying, no, no, we absolutely do need. Uh, more Marx and more Hegel in our thinking about um, niche construction. So yes, what you had was uh, a scientist would come in and say, all you barley farmers, here's a, here's a diagram, go and make your um, pasture look like this, and chaos ensu um, ensued. That kind of top-down intervention didn't really work. But the combination, it's not just um, farmers doing their own thing, it's um, a combination of bottom-up and top-down. We do not want to um, get the sort of uh, Heideggerian notion, uh, this romantic notion that uh, these peasants close to the earth, um, they have their knowledge and um, we have our rationality, but we shouldn't try to um, get to their unique knowledge. No, they were absolutely rational. They were acting rationally. They were sharing knowledge and they were constructing knowledge as well as constructing um, these um, niches. Uh, of course they were. What we need uh, within talking about Marx is a more sophisticated notion of representation. And I think that's what Marx and Vygotsky give us. And I'm thankful um, for Deacon for showing me why. Um, and I'm going to explain as, as quickly as I can um, three stages to this process that can help us to understand how we can talk about the architect's map or any representation without it um, being in this sort of way, I guess you could call um, Stalinist. Um, and I actually owe a lot of what I'm going to say to um, insights from Sasha Freiberg, who I'm happy was able to join us. Maybe you can uh, tell me where I got all of this wrong later. Um, okay, there's three types of um, sign. There are icons that uh, physically resemble something. That's literally what an icon is. So, I mean, this moth is kind of a, uh, a, a, a reverse icon because it um, makes the predator not be able to interpret it. But it looks like the leaf, therefore it's an icon of the leaf. Um, a bear has scratched into the oak here, and it's an index. It has index locality, which means it's tied to um, the thing that made it. It signals to other animals or other bears, this is the bear's territory, but it doesn't itself look like a bear, but same as um, if a barbet monkey sees the shadow of an eagle, the shadow might not look like an eagle, but that it's a shadow is an index of the fact that it's an eagle. And above that, we have the symbol, and uh, the, uh, the symbol is untethered from the referent and communicating something beyond the immediate environment. Now, you can trace these three stages uh, through much of Vygotsky's writing about signs. And I haven't uh, done the job, I haven't put Ilyenkov onto here because it requires a little bit more work. Um, and yeah, perhaps um, Sasha Freiburg can help me with this later, uh, partly because um, some of the wording, the terms are a bit different. Anyway, icon. A child wanted to, um, this is already um, humanized um, activity. So we're already talking about humanized activity. We're, we're not talking about moths and birds. Within humanized activity, an icon. A child wanted to draw, uh, wanted to show in the drawing how it gets darker when the curtains are closed 
and he made a forceful line down the board as if he were drawing a window shade. The drawing movement did not signify a chord, but expressed specifically the movement uh, of drawing a curtain. So Vygotsky suggests that even the drawing of a picture should first be understood in terms of discursive functions as an analog to speech rather than mental representations. He explains it further that a picture of a doll is representing her doll is something a child must learn. If you just show a child a picture of a doll, she won't be able to look, point at it and say, that's my doll. It's not given by the picture itself. It's learned in play. We do not start with representations of which we introspect. We form the um, representations through our activity. Okay, index. As a child develops mastery in symbolic activity, she moves from expressing intentions in direct action to enacting a plan of action. For, uh, for example, in assigning different household objects to function as different buildings of a town. So it's a clock and the number one is going to be um, the, the paracetamol, the number two is going to be aspirin, she decides that the different numbers are different medicines. Uh, it's kind of working indexically. So a, a clock can re represent a pharmacy for the child, not because it looks like a pharmacy, but because it's able to embody directly the child's intentions in pretend play. She can walk the doll from the clock tower to the pharmacy or talk about different numbers on the clock as different medicines. That's how Vygotsky is explaining it. At this stage, the plan is particular to and shades through the situation activity. So th that word plan is quite loaded. Um, I don't have time to unpack it yet, but hopefully you see the general gist that it's not just that it looks like a pharmacy, there's some sort of um, a function that's been put on there. The child relies on um, indexical relations between objects of their activity and mediating artifacts. Finally, the plans of action are reified or crystallized in the object. I think it's really interesting that Vygotsky is using this word reified, um, well, as, as well as crystallized he, um, throughout his work. He's not using reified here. I'm putting it back in from when he uses it later. In new situations, the child can go and grab the clock to mean pharmacy, though the connection to the concrete activity for which it was baptized, a pharmacy, may be forgotten. Here, the external sign is internalized, so that in the same way, the stick acquires the seemingly inherent affordance that makes it an appropriate force in various role plays so that another child sees a boy with a stick between his legs running around and she straight away knows oh um he's a cowboy or whatever uh, though it's more complicated than this we might say that a thing stands for another not immediately present thing at this stage Tomasello does not like this because of his um, pedigree. He is, he's come through traditional cognitivist psychology and he wants to see the world in terms of um, information, which is then cognized. Everything is input, is information. He's not interested in the ways in which objects and language then reshape um, our activity, uh, both our own activity and our uh, uh, activity in that Baldwinian sense over history. Okay, so he considers, is iconicity involved in symbolic gesture? Symbolic gestures, he says, are the same as spoken symbols and being only conventionally connected to their intended reference. What children learn are social conventions, not material responses. Something about what he says here, which is right, which is, yeah, okay, if I have a 10 pound note, then it's not really linked to a reference. There isn't, a, um, it, uh, it's not worth, it's not linked to 10 pounds worth of chocolates. So from that point of view, he is right. But his conclusion is that therefore, what we should be looking for is coherence with conventions. Coherence with conventions, as John McDowell memorably said of Tomasello's favorite philosopher, Donald Davidson, that leaves us with frictionless spinning in a void. Conventions on conventions on conventions, 
leaves the real world behind and it could lead us into dualism or idealism. The evidence Tomasella offers for this conclusion presupposes the intentional state that he's meant to be arguing for. He says, in experiments, 18 month olds are unable to use iconicity to understand an adult specific communicative intention. Secondly, he claims that um, well, so firstly, in terms of the, the 18 month old, can't use iconicity to understand an adult specific communicative intention. Well, why should they? It's only at a symbolic level that they should be understanding the adult specific intentions. Okay, secondly, he claims that uh, the earliest in the earlier stages, deaf children learning sign language are not helped by the iconicity of many sign language si uh, signs. And he implies that arbitrary gestures would have done just as well. And there's a level, there's a reason, a level in which he's right that, okay, there might be a sign that's something like, uh, uh, embarrassingly, I'm sorry, I don't um, know sign language, but there might be a sign that doesn't look like something like, um, I don't know, this could be um, the gesture for. Um, I don't know, escalator, even though it doesn't look like an escalator, so fine, it becomes disconnected. All right. An arbitrary gesture would have done just as well misses the fact that there is nonetheless, if we look at sign language, there's surely something about the way in which it is embodied that's very much to do with iconicity, or better still, it's to do with certain schemes of movement that Tomasello is missing. For whatever reason, Tomasello really doesn't like the word body um, in Becoming Human, um, his magnum opus, quite recent. He only mentions the body to talk about people observing their own or others' bodies. The more interesting point is that we do not, we do not need to have an either or. We don't need to have materiality or conventionality. The Zagorsk School for Deaf and Blind um, was established with the lead of followers of Vygotsky and uh, Ilyenkov became very interested in it. And I want to um, come to a few of the things that... Um, oh, we're, we're getting a bit running out of time now. Oh, am I? <laughs> yeah. So oh, sorry about that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm near the end. Is it all right if I kind of rush through this bit? No, it's a couple of minutes, really. So, Sorry, I didn't realize that. Okay, um, so I'll, 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 um, basically they, they, were, they successfully got kids who were deaf and blind to um, uh, become normal functioning citizens. Uh, one of them uh, got his PhD in um, psychology. But anyway, yeah, th th this is honestly near, nearing the end. This is the, the home stretch. Um, reading Ilyankov. Okay, Ilyankov says here the first elementary cellular, the first elementary cellular form of the human mind turns out to be uh, the work of the hands in accordance with a schema and the longer tra trajectory determined not by biological, biologically inbuilt requirements, but by the form and disposition of things created by human labor, created by man for man. The child does not want to eat with a spoon. He resists and tries, as before, to thrust his snout into the bowl but they do not let him instead they stick something in between his snout and the bowl some sort of inconvenient object superfluous to the old move a superfluous and incomprehensible mediating link to the spoon and this mediating link requires unfamiliar actions of him actions the schemas for which are inscribed neither in the organic need itself nor in the object say in the porridge but only in the form and designation the designated purpose of a spoon so there's no inner grammar of spoons. The spoon itself provides the grammar because people are teaching um, how to use the grammar of the spoon in this situation. Um, and it is this world of forms of social human life activity that confronts the, new the newborn child, to be exact, the biological organism of the species Homo sapien, as the objectivity to which he is compelled to adapt all his behavior, all the functions of his organic body as the object towards assimilation of which his elders guide all his activity. The individual is obliged to subordinate his actions to certain rules and patterns which he, has, which he has to assimilate as a special object in order to make them rules and patterns of the life of his own body. This thing 
is then only after this, only after this indexical and iconic stage is then transformed into a symbol, the meaning of which always remains external to its immediately perceptible appearance into other centrally perceivable things and is revealed only through the whole system of relations of other things towards this given thing. I'm going to give a concrete example um, rather than going through a lot of philosophy. Um, this icon of the, uh, the England flag, indexical on England, but as a symbol of Hoogl of nationalism and hooliganism, nothing to do with me having shared intentions with the people who wear around, go around wearing this flag. It's to do with their concrete activities, to do with the fact that they're um, smashing beer glasses in Soho and shouting racist stuff that gives it this symbolic association. You have to look at the system of a whole. And that's what uh, gives it this other thing. That other thing is no less concrete. It is not, we don't have to search in ahead to find it. So concluding thoughts from, I, I won't go with that, it's too long. Um, words derive their meanings from the role they play in patterns of human action and interaction. Language is a refinement that gives us the ability to make finer distinctions in the world. Thank you very much. So the point is we share tools and symbols, not intentional states. Thank you, Carol. Amazing. That last picture, you should let us look at it for a second longer. Oh, uh, oh sorry, I didn't realize I, I, I went on for so long. You did. You're very naughty. I, I went on for ages. I apologize to everyone. I'm going to be sure the last picture. I did. Um, yeah, I think everybody wants to look at your last graphic. I see your hand is going to you'll be the first to speak. Do you want to ask it? Unmute, yeah. <laughs> Are you, would you like to ask your question, make a point, Iskander? And after that, I didn't. We can't hear you, Iskander. We still can't hear you. Oh dear, no, no sound from you. No? Now we can hear you. Yes. Well, no. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I just upload it, upload it. Thank you. And one thank uh, Mr. Patapa for his great presentation. Everything was clear. And uh, I just appreciate it. I liked it. And just uh, want to thank him. Thank you, Ms. Patapa. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's great. Thank you. I think um, we all liked it, I, Carol, I think. Um, Aydin, did you want to ask a question? Of course. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. It was, um, it was wonderful. So my question is about the implication of your thesis is for collective activist systems. When people are coming together around this uh, common or semi-common uh, object and they try to achieve a goal, what would it happen like beyond the individual context interaction or development? What if the subject is collective? And what are the implications of your work for the larger activist systems? Thank you. Okay, yeah. It, it, it's a hard question. So are you asking sort of, the, 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 one of the things that I want to stress is that it's very rare that when people come together and say, let's create some symbols that that works, that what's actually happening is that there are things going on that are a lower grade uh, kinds of um, normativity where um, what people are doing is just getting on with what they were usually doing. And then it's parts of what they were already doing that then become symbols. So I think what happens is, I mean, um, it, it happens because so it, in the in the Racine and Carpendale sense, it's it's because they need to make um, finer distinctions. It's because they need to make finer distinctions in the world. I in um, my work with talking to teenagers and getting them to uh, think about their own self tracking data, um, a girl explained 
how her data uh, in the week before had made her feel. And another uh, student said, do you mean this? Um, and then the girl had to go back and say, okay, well, I said it affected me, but like there's affected and then there's affected. So I guess I need like two or pr probably even three different symbols for all the different kinds of affected. And then she had a bit of time to think about what she means. And then she said, okay, so if it's the storm cloud, then I'm saying it's like the kind of affected where it stops me from thinking of other things. And then if it's the affected that's the black cloud, then it means that it makes me sad, but I carry on doing what I was doing. And uh, okay, etc. But what then happened is um, we, as a small group of seven, were saying, okay, so was that a a storm cloud? A, a storm cloud for you? Uh, was that a more of a rainbow cloud? Was that a black cloud? Um, so it came up as something needed to make a meaningful distinction, um, and then that meaningful distinction. Some some of them, when we put them into the discourse, when they became part of the activity of actually trying to express meaning, uh, they proved not to be useful. So someone might invent something to say. Uh, okay, I'm going to use this symbol to mean um, I'm angry at my mum. And then it turns out, oh, we don't need a symbol for being angry at my mum. And it just falls away. But if it's a successful symbol, then black cloud will suddenly mean something tiny bit different for this person in this interaction. And then here's this new situation, and it again means something slightly different. And then suddenly we're like, oh, wow, the black cloud has take, taken on a life of its own. And I, I almost can't explain it using the words that I was using before. And it now exists as uh, as part of um, the activity as um, black cloud, as, as, as indeed it has done. Like the, the black cloud has continued to now be a symbol that has all kinds of meanings. I can't just sit here and list for you now. Um, through that, well, trial and error is the is the short answer. That it starts with concrete activity. There's a need to make a, to justify yourself better or to make a, a distinction, and then some of those distinctions, some of those new words, some of those new tools work and keep working in new situations between new people, and some just fall away and are never used again. Thank you very much. No, you're next. You've got to unmute, Lars. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Kirill. Very, very interesting. And um, of course, this is a very complicated uh, field, you know, <clears throat> with lots of uh, very tricky concepts involved here. And I, I don't really know what I'm going to say here, but I'm, I'm very much inspired by a communication theory called integrational linguistics, which <clears throat> was developed uh, yeah, in Oxford during the um, 20th century by uh, <clears throat> Roy Harris and his colleagues. And basically he, he wrote a book called The Language Myth. And basically what he says is that the, the basic foundations for uh, conventional language is wrong, you know. Uh, uh, he talks about um, this sort of general a uh, convention or, or conception that language is, is a, about transmitting messages between a sender and, and, and um, uh, uh, oh, what do you call it? I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Receivers, thank you. Uh, and uh, he calls this telementation. And basically, this is wrong. You know, there is no message in an utterance or in a in a book that is transmitted between uh, minds, you know. So what it says is that you have to get rid of all kinds of conceptions that is about uh, uh, distributing or, or dealing or sharing mind content, you know, that there is no such thing, you know, because it's, it's entirely internal. Uh, and that makes it uh, uh, 
questionable to, to say things like the, the, you had the, the Baldwin quotation saying that the social projects itself into the personality, you know, and the question here is how does that occur, you know, which is the actor here? Is the social a transmitting something into the internal mind? And, you know, it's this kind of thinking <clears throat> that is those sort of questions here. And, and I think if you're ever going to get some kind of, of um, coherent conception about signification, meaning, uh, language, you have to start in that kind of thinking, you know, it's, uh, you have to get rid of, of, of a number of uh, number of conceptions that seems to be very natural on the surface, but in, in fact are very uh, complicated and very questionable. And um, yeah, that, that's just a comment, you know, and, and for me, it, this kind of uh, communication theory that's proposed by integrational linguists has sort of cleared up a lot of model thinking that I used to do <laughs> during my career. You know? So maybe you should um, take a look into that. Thanks. Thanks, Lars. Yeah, I, I certainly agree that uh, we shouldn't think of uh, information in terms of communicating a message from uh, one head into another. That was my point about Thomas Sowell's part as well. Uh, I think there's actually quite a lot of rigorous stuff that we, ca we can say um, about uh, the individual and the personality um, to do with, um, yeah, it's something that Vygotsky has looked at a lot uh, through Spinoza mainly, but um, yeah, your general point, I agree with, thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm the chair, but um, I want to say uh, the um, concept of co-evolution, Carol, that you um, started with and showed the as a thread, it was actually a thread in your presentation, this co-evolution of um, many aspects of co-evolution, the individual and the social. I mean, the, the problem with this um, idea that is the individual first, is the social first, is a, is a non-question because you cannot develop as an individual without the social. The two are they're self-related opposites, and this is where the dialectical approach is vital. And that's what that was um, Vygotsky's huge contribution, as I as I understand it. This um, and that, that not just co-evolution, but co trans and the transformation out of the co-evolution. That developing a, um, a language is a it's a hard, it's a, it's a qualitative leap. Communication is not the same as language. This is, animals clearly do communicate in very complex ways. And they do have types of language, as you pointed out, but developing abstract concepts is not the same thing. And if you, if you take the most basic linguistic structure, um, a sentence, an, an object and a subject, a subject and an object, that already has, as Hegel pointed out, <laughs> millions of years of development behind it for people to even to be able to think that way. So I think, you know, Vygotsky draws on Hegel as well in this respect. Um, and I, I just think this question of abstract thought, I mean, Vygotsky talked about higher mental functions, didn't he? I mean, um, I don't think animals can, without a language, without language, abstract thought, is it possible? I'm not sure, I don't think so. Yeah, so, well, yeah. I would say without symbolism. Mm -hmm. So I think there are lots of pre-linguistic signs that also allow non-linguistic animals to do a lot of coordination. And what I've been saying, the where we leave behind other animals is that they can do signs at the iconic and indexical level. So, um, yeah, uh, Vygotsky and Thomas Ello says this as well. And then that builds up into gestures, gestures built up into mime, ritual, etc. And that's sort of how we go. So, I do that, like, there is a pre linguistic level, but it's like pseudo 
linguistic. There's like a proto language. The point being as well, sorry, just to finish and to relate it to Yenko, this question of the universal and the particular, um, the absolute, the general and the, the general and the universal and the individual and general and the particular are embodied in language. So if you say John is a man or this cat is black, you already have, or no, sorry, this animal is a cat, or this cat is an animal, you already have the individual and universal in the most simple sentence and you already have logic in it as well there's a logic which is so it must be this level of abstraction is a qualitative leap from just communication i'd say thanks thanks anyone else i'm sorry i left okay. so, so, so little time for questions i do hope we can save some more joanne Joanne, did you want to speak? You've got to unmute yourself. I don't know if you want to speak. That's me. Right, can you hear me now? All good. Right, okay. I, 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 it's an excellent presentation, uh, Kirill. I thoroughly uh, enjoyed it. I'd just like to show a, a control panel that I, I made myself. If you, I don't know if I can nice. get light on this. Not doing very well. Can you, can you, can you make out what I'm? There's not, mm -hmm. enough, there's not enough light on it. Well, it's it's, it's a control panel, um, and what it has is it has uh, levers uh, to lever switches, uh, and it has letter lettering, and it has coloring. So there's all sorts of um, symbolism going on there. The, the purpose of all this is so that I know how to operate. I know how to, which which lever to press for the the the, the operations that I want to uh, to complete. Uh, and of course, the 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 this it's a spectrum of colours. So, so the the spectrum represents different um, areas of the um the, the the thing that it controls and the, the lettering also uh, um, that is the first letter of something that refers to parts of the system so so this is something invented by myself but of course it's a lot of it is is pre is is, is social knowledge that I'm using uh, and it's something that that could be explained to somebody else, so it could be communicated uh, because there, there are, there's, there's a, ra the rationale behind it. It's, it's, it's the symbolism. Uh, so that's, that's just a, <laughs> an immediate example of what some of the things that Kittle have been talking about. I, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say here. Yeah, th thanks, absolutely. Already saying that someone has written a poem in a way that's a similar thing. Andrew wants to speak. Sorry, I was muted. Andy, you got your next. Hi, uh, thanks very much. I want to pick up, go back to to Lars and, and Corinna. My sound's not been very good, but I think I picked up most. Um, the the point that Lars made. She's talking about Roy Harris and integrationism. Um, and uh, it, 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 there's important work by Peter Jones which takes Harris and uh, it, the first thing Jones does is, is critique Vygotsky it's quite, you know, quite a, a strong critique of Vygotsky um, in the latest work of Peter Jones he's now critiquing Ilyenkov on the basis of this integrationist work of Harris um, I think that's the, these are the most important critiques of Ilyenkov there are out there at the moment, uh, are really important. Um, and so I was, I was thinking about that as, as, as through your talk and then through the, the discussion. Um, one way of thinking about, and I'm no expert on this, I've just read a bit of Jones, uh, at Lars much more expert than I am. Uh, but one way I understand Jones's interpretation of Harris is he's, 
there's really a critique of the idea that you can have a system of language, that language is a system, self-consistent system, uh, in and of itself, that can be studied by a, ling a linguist. Um, uh, and I guess there's something about that each, there are, there are objective words uh, which ha are expressed in symbols, which are given to individuals and have to, individuals are socialised into these objective given bits of language in symbols. Um, so there's two two concepts, critiques there. Critique of the idea of, uh, uh, that there's a self-consistent, a self-contained system that we call language that could be studied by a linguist. And then there's the uh, a critique of the idea that there's self-contained uh, 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 units of language uh, it, it, which society gives to individuals. Um, I guess integrationism would be integrating language with activity and culture and other forms of uh, 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 um, uh, social life uh, and material life and saying it can't be distinguished from that. Um, it's a very strong critique. Where it comes to be a critique of Ilyenkov is actually comes from what Karina was saying. So Karina is making the, the, the key point that for Ilyenkov, there's something about universality and universality is expressed in ideal forms, uh, the, the, the purest of which the, is language. Uh, 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 and so the language is required to express universals uh, in Ilyenkov. And then that gets you the impression that you get these universals, which are real, they're part of real infinite nature substance, uh, um, uh, they're then objectively expressed in, in, in language, which then is inculcated, socialised into individuals. Um, so I think these are really, I, I agree with Ilyenkov, but I think that Harris and Jones need to be addressed. Uh, uh, and really, and that's a really important debate to have in the future. Uh, um, so I'd be very interested again, like Lars, I'd urge you, um, Kirill, to, to address Harris and Jones for the yes. future work. It'd be great. Thankfully, Andy, um, this work is going to be part of an article that will be out in two weeks uh, addressed at Jones. Um, so it's, uh, well, via an intermediary. Um, Chris Drain is a, a philosopher who's a big fan of um, Jones. So a lot of this is me responding uh, to that line of thinking. Um, a lot of it, I, I think, is interesting uh, to all of these uh, people like Irving Goffman, who really highlight the situated, improvised nature of um, language, etc. Um, just on Team Universals, in my presentation, I've got the heavy hitter uh, on my team uh, is not just uh, Ilyenkov, it's Peirce, and I would go back to Peirce. Uh, but also, Ilyenkov himself is not um, either super He's not a super nominalist or anti-nominalist. He's got quite a um, nuanced view. So I, I don't think, well, I'll have to read the critique of Ilyenkov. I, universals just don't sound like the, the level of at which um, this is going to uh, live or die. I, I get the point about like um, what is a language, thinking of it in terms of um, frag uh, fragmented um, functional mul mul multiplicities, um, that it's not a like complete circuit, um, to say it in the most simple way. Um, but I've got two separate, yeah, so hopefully uh, read this, it'll answer some of the questions um, in what I think an engaging answer would be like. I've got a separate piece about uh, Jones's use of ethnomethodology, which is all of this, everything's situated and uh, nothing is certain stuff that's an entirely different type of argument, but I'm not rooting for Team Heidi here anytime soon. Can you put um, something in the chat about the sign symbol language Makaton? How it, and but um, Lars is Lars has got his hand up. So while Lars, you want to unmute yourself, Lars? 
Well, it's, it's just a comment to Andrew. I think, uh, <clears throat> I also think it's very important that we address this critique, you know, and especially uh, the, the view of language as a system uh, of units and rules. Uh, and what uh, Harris says is basically that words does not contain meaning, you know. <clears throat> meaning is a construction of the individual when he attends something like a word in, in print or hearing something. Uh, so, so there is no meaning of, or in, in items out there, you know, <clears throat> that's just um, the interpretation of what the meaning is necessary requires the objective of, of the, the language out there. I can't really explain this, you know, but, but uh, there is something very basic about this, you know, that we can't think of, of, of uh, uh, a text as containing meaning, you know, it, it's, it's just a text. And the interpretation of that is entirely up to the individual, you know, whether you can, read the language, what kind of background you have, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly what we'd end up saying. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I appreciate it. I'll, I'll, I'll send you the um, completed thing. So let, let's see if we can continue this. Yes, thank you, thank you, Mark. We've got like one or two more. If anybody else wants to make a quick point before we go, slowly go to a close. Uh, anyone else with any comments or small questions or more straightforward, simple, silly questions. Will we, will we get a chance to see the uh, the article soon? Oh yeah, it, yeah, yeah, sure. It, it doesn't have all, all of the stuff in it. It's a, a long running reply thread between me, Seattle, oh. Azari, and Chris Train. It is true, Carol, isn't it? That there is a, a number of Attacks being made on Vygotsky, actually. There's a Vygotsky revisionism going on, isn't there? Oh, yeah, but I mean, the yeah, yeah, stuff is. Very, makes very important the, the stuff Andrew was talking about is actually worth um, engaging with as a, and interesting. There's no. But Yatnitsky's stuff about Vygotsky being a Nietzschean and all that isn't worth looking at. Um, well, it's a very important question. Do universals, do abstractions have a real content? Do they have a content? So, as Ilyenko writes, we have to say yes, <laughs> Un unequivocally, <laughs> which is the point of Carol's entire presentation, I think. Um, the, okay, Ralph and Lars, you want, uh, um, Ralph is, is Cole, not Gerald Cole, it's Cole. Anyway, Lars, do you want to make a final point? Do you want to speak, Lars? You had your hand up. Okay, yeah, well, I, I just want to un underline what you, Corinna, said about uh, the dialectics there uh, in, in the previous comment. That um, I don't think you, you can think of Vygotsky's general law as phases that comes before and after. It's a dialectical uh, process, you know, and I think I demonstrated that very, very clearly with my example from my grandchild, you know. It, 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 all happens at the same time, and it's a dialectical relation between the individual and the, the social environment. Uh, yeah, that, that's basically. I want to underline that that comment that you made. Well, yeah, yeah. Just just one final point. I mean, this whole thing about is the system handed down by society is an anti-dialectical point of view anyway, because language is a living thing that is constantly being reconstructed as each individual enters into society they reconstruct the language they're part of a massive continuous ongoing process it's not something we just hand it down we make it we do it the child does it and it, by every generation every new person entering into the universal is changing that universal and that that's the dialectic of it and, and just to see it as a static system, mechanical system, is completely alien to, to language itself. As we know, language is constantly developing. Even they try to fix it, it's very it's impossible. <laughs> um, but so, some, system, some systems are handed down. Yeah, they are. The grammar is handed down. The social down. system is handed down. The state system is handed down. The economy is handed down. Social structures are handed down. You're born into a given state, political state. That is. So, yeah, 
there are some things that uh, are also transmitted uh, immediately you are born, you have to be registered with the state and, uh, and so on. So there are many, many things that are already given, uh, which you have to learn and you have to learn the language of them too. Um, and you have to know where the registry office is to reg in order to go and register your child. So there are many things that are given and you do, you know, you don't develop them. They are there for you to develop or accept and they play a great they play a great weight in reinforcing the status quo because they are there and they are inherited from hundreds of years of previous social political development so it's another i know it's another area altogether but it's worth thinking about they're not immutable though are they pardon they're not immutable they do change they do change but do they change in a transformative way they do change it i would say they evolve I would more than change the the state as we have it today is the same state of the of 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 sixteen eighty eight in essence it has changed its form but it's the same state that's another question historical other questions anyway sorry Andy's got his hand up thank you Paul yeah following on from the this discussion my other comment on your talk. My main thought on your talk, Kirill, was I suppose what is historically uh, uh, um, given, in a nutshell, are the social relations of production, is the mode of production. And I, I suppose a general comment I would have that, that came out from your talk is I felt to some degree, of course, your, your talk's on language, so you're focusing on language, but the, the danger is to is to abstract language from activity and not just individual activity but the the social production the, the, the mode of social production and the social relations of production um and that would be the the important thing is to root language in in production and the, there's a real problem with that you know a lot of what we discussed in previous weeks uh, was a pro with that quote of marx about the bees uh, uh which is a really problematic one to interpret if you just look at it in isolation a better quote from Marx is, I think, German ideology, when he says you, know, you could distinguish a an humans from animals in any way you like. He mentions language, but they themselves distinguish themselves from animals uh, when they begin to produce their means of subsistence. So I, I would look at objective uh, relations of production, labour, forms of labour, and integrate language within that. And I'd want an analysis of language to for foreground that. Uh, I suppose the question for you would be, to what degree do you think your interpretation of Vygotsky is able to do that? And is there a problem? You're focusing on language less, but is there a problem? That, can you integrate it with the broader relations of production? I mean, it depends if what you mean, mean by production. The social practice um, is something which the language is embedded into. And as I said, uh, there are signs which become implicated in what is already being done within the certain activity systems um, so people enter in schools they've got all kinds of customs that they're uh, following because they're school kids there's certain things that they're doing and then we can intervene in that and create kind of micro uh, social pr productions and kind of try to rejig some of the conventions and then language will start developing as we try to help each other orient in this new space that we've created. Um, I, 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 I definitely a limitation of Vygotsky is that it's a focus on the individual and dyad. So that I completely um, take on board. But I, I mean, yeah, discourse is both itself a practice and of course, um, something which is appropriated into practices, reshapes practices, um, and you can do that talking about a classroom, same as you can talk about wider um, labor practices. I, I, I just let, yeah, but I think social relations production in this context is very much uh, uh, social system wide. So capitalistic versus pre-capitalistic uh, and how you integrate that, that system wide uh, uh, analysis 
uh, with you know going into a school and the sort of what you were talking about. So it's that integrating of the of the, of the wider system, the social system, with the individual. Uh, uh, so it's social practices like uh, going to work for a wage in a, in a capitalistic system or being a slave in a in, in a slave society, and that that general social so those general social relations of production then shape uh, what you can and what discourses you can and can't have, what language you can and can't have, what words mean has to be has to be related to the the, 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 the predominant mode of production of, of society. Those sorts of questions are what I had in mind, and I think what Marx has in mind when he talks about it, it, producing your means of subsistence, you end up producing a social system, social relations of production which predominate and then colour individual activities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry, who, who was speaking? Because we, we're, we're running out of time. Who, who was speaking now? Sorry. Do, do, we, we, I think we're going to have to close, Joanne. I'm sorry. Right. Um, because I, there's a couple of points, a couple of announcements. Um, I was just going to say something very brief. It's going to be 30 seconds, Joanne. Right. Uh, there are differences uh, between classes of the language that's used, uh, and especially in, in the ne in the neoliberal period, there, there's a whole different language coming to being that's, that's, that's assimilated by people who identify with with neoliberalism. Neoliberalism. So, the the relationship to the means of production is 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 still very important in that respect. Thank you, Joanne, um, and thank you, Andy and Paul and Penny for the additional comments um, and giving it a different, you know, a, showing another side, some other sides to this issue to take the language into the context of the economic and the political. Um, just to thank everybody very much for taking part in this and particularly Kirill for his very good presentation. Um, thank you again, Carol. And thank you, everybody new and old. And if you haven't already agreed to your email being on our email list, please write it in the chat now because some of you, we've got, we won't put you on the list unless you request it. 